and today we have, uh, what, by what I see, 78 participants on the computer and probably a few more on the phone. And so um, welcome and we're really glad that you're here. Uh, today we're going to be covering the edible indoor garden and I'm Rhonda Furry. I'm an extension educator in horticulture. I cover Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell counties and I also am the statewide master naturalist coordinator. You should have a couple of handouts to help you follow along today. I have a handout that's called the indoor edible garden up at the upper right and <laughs> has some uh, talking points on it and then the second page is a table of uh, different vegetables that you could grow in containers. And somebody has an open mic, could you please all make sure you mute um, your systems? Thank you. The other handout, if you chose to print it out, is out of all the PowerPoints. And so hopefully you'll be able to follow along with that. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, kind of just a little bit of introduction here. Why do we want to grow our own food indoors? Well, for me, certainly it's so I can have fresh produce or fresh uh, foods of some sort all year long. Um, there's a lot of controversy, but, you know, some a lot of people do think that it is healthier and tastier. And certainly uh, this is a picture of my husband and my son in the outdoor garden, but uh, outdoor or indoors, regardless, if you're growing your own food, it does build family and community uh, in a very uh, green way. Um, homegrown food is also obviously local food. Local food is a, a really a, a strong trend right now, and lots of people um, want to make sure that they're buying as local as they can. Uh, again, it's really your decision on, on what local means to you, whether it's uh, within the state of Illinois or if it's within a certain number of miles. And, and each of us has, you know, our own reasoning for why we think that we should or shouldn't um, buy local or, or buy the majority of our food in a, in a local uh, source. Lots of different ways that you can buy food locally in addition to growing your own. Um, I'm sure a lot of you visit farmers markets, um, uh, grocery stores, a lot of those do label the foods um, that are grown and where they are grown. Um, you may have a subscription to a community supported ag uh, service, uh, which is you're seeing a picture of here on the slide, or buy directly from the farmer. Really, we are seeing, uh, with the use of high tunnel and other uh, different uh, growing features, we can you know, grow food much longer into the fall and earlier in the spring, and really, in some cases, all year round. So even if you're not able to grow your own food indoors uh, at your own house, uh, you should be able to find some local food in, in some location. I, I was uh, went to a program one time, it was an extension program in Quincy, so some of you may remember this, but uh, we had the speakers were a uh, husband and wife who wrote this book called Plenty, and it was really interesting. Uh, they said that their book, of course, was named Plenty, One Man, One Woman, a raucous year of eating locally, and their uh, self-inflicted, I guess, uh, rules was that they had a 100-mile di diet for a whole year. And it was interesting to hear their reasonings and, and their challenges and struggles in trying to find food that was only available within a 100-mile uh, radius. Um, and they had lots of reasons for why they uh, wanted to do that. Uh, you can see some of those listed here. Uh, and each of us, again, has uh, different reasons why maybe we want to uh, eat locally. Excuse me. I, I, yes. Um, our screen is not advancing automatically, so can you tell us when we need to advance the screen? Sure, I can do that. We should be on local food in the future, Epcot's Living Lands, which is slide number seven. Ron, Rhonda, you... Rhonda, this yeah. is Tom. If I could interject there uh, to that office that just indicated the slides weren't advancing. I'm wondering if, in fact, they've got a button at the, near the top of their screen that says join the presenter or rejoin the presenter or something like that, um, because maybe no. they hit it. No, we don't. Okay. Thanks, Tom, for trying, and if you think of anything else, let us know. I'll, I'll try to remember to tell you to advance as we go along here. Um, 
Again, back to slide number seven, um, many of us may have visited Disney's Epcot, um, where you could see uh, kind of this uh, food of the future, and I was there probably 30 years ago, and remember it was uh, very futuristic, and, and now we do see some more uh, places where we grow foods indoors, obviously, uh, maybe not as fancy as the slide you're seeing here, but um, the Epcot Living Lands, the original uh, intent was to show kind of giant space farms or these soilless farms that you could grow. Uh, desert biospheres and city greenhouses all, all run from computers. Uh, seemed really futuristic at the time, but we do have some of that happening, uh, around, you know, in some degree uh, today. Uh, the next slide shows that uh, somewhere uh, in between all of those, uh, from the plenty of growing all of your own food uh, yourself to maybe this futuristic Epcot model, somewhere in between is what we're going to to talk about today. So the homeowner's edible indoor garden, uh, you know, you do that for the reasons that you want to and, um, and to the degree that um, works for you and your location. So the next slide we're going to talk a little bit about a few things that could be grown indoors and I give you some examples at the end of the presentation today and also in your handout. Herbs are probably the most common and also salad greens. I do grow herbs, uh, depends on, on what I have in production at the time in my kitchen, uh, but I pretty much have herbs all year round. Sometimes we'll add some salad greens um, and I've grown carrots indoors and I've been wanting to try some other things and, and hopefully we'll do that soon and I'm sure many of you have grown uh, some of the other uh, foods that are listed here on this slide. Really the only limitation in growing food indoors is your environment. And so we're going to spend just a little bit of time here today going through um, how to set your environment up so that you can have the, the optimum growing uh, situation. And uh, some of this uh, will be a little bit of review for some of you on, on how to set up your uh, indoor environment as far as light and water and temperature and that sort of thing. But uh, again, we're focusing on, on how to grow food indoors. The next slide then, uh, looking at the environmental conditions for indoors, I'm going to go through the proper growing conditions with our light, temperature, and atmosphere. We'll go through those uh, just a little bit. And then also a little bit on proper plant care. Um, uh, not a lot because, uh, you know, we that's kind of a whole other program on how to do proper plant care, uh, media, nutrients, and then also um, a water, how to properly water the, the plants that you're growing indoors. The next slide, uh, then we'll talk with light. And uh, when I was on campus, I've been with Extension about 26 years, and I started my Extension career at the University of Illinois campus, and I taught the indoor houseplant class, actually, and we talked a lot about light. And I always uh, I taught it is the three aspects of light, and three things to think about when you're um, going to be adding light indoors or using natural lighting through your windows or some type of uh, other uh, window uh, structure. Uh, the intensity of how bright it is, so we'll uh, look at that just a little bit here on the next slide. Uh, the duration of how long do you light, and then quality, uh, what color is that light um, as we go along. And I'm seeing some uh, a question in the chat window, and, and I think I'm just going to keep going, and then I'll stop at some point and try to go back and answer some of those questions. But uh, it's a little bit distracting uh, as I'm trying to talk and um, read the chat window. So um, I'm not ignoring you, but we will get back to it at some point. Uh, intensity of how bright it is. Uh, intensity of lights is usually measured in foot candles, which is the, as you can see a picture of here, uh, one uh, unit of light produced by a standard candle uh, that is viewed uh, from a distance of one foot. And you can measure that with lots of different ways. You can measure it um, just kind of by a chart of, of what the, you know, kind of the uh, area feels or looks like to you as what you're used to. Um, you can measure it with light meters uh, and you can also measure it with the photo photometers on, on a camera. Um, and uh, I, if you want information on how to do that, I could. you can look it up and, and we'll, I'll show you that as well. The next slide then, uh, just kind of again looking at the comparisons as you're kind of familiar with these different areas. 
is, you know, an office. I'm sitting in an office right now in Havana, Illinois, <laughs> and I have a fluorescent lights overhead and a fairly large window, but it's pretty cloudy outside, obviously, today, at least in this part of the state. And so uh, the foot candles in here are really low, probably less than 200. Um, the fluorescent lights, uh, if you're you know, a little bit closer, uh, 240 watt bulbs would put off about 300 to 500. But most of our food crops, if we really look through um, the literature um, and, you know, that we typically would grow outdoors, most of those need a thousand plus. And so uh, typically our indoor environments are really limiting. The, the light is probably our most limiting factor of growing plants indoors. The next slide uh, shows, I talked about, uh, said that you could measure light with your camera. And so here's how it's done. Um, if you have an adjustable camera where you actually set uh, your film speed and your shutter speed and your f-stop, uh, then you can use this, uh, actually, this table here on this slide, um, which should also be in your handout, uh, on your handout of all the slides, um, that shows you how you can measure um, the candles using your camera if you don't have a, a photo meter, a light meter. The next slide, uh, looking at then, uh, first, of course, was the in intensity of how bright it is. The second one would be how long do we want a light. And, of course, that varies by the time of the year and, and the location. Uh, certainly right now our days are getting a little bit longer, uh, and uh, um, but, you know, we're still spring's just around the corner as, as we the days are lengthening um, here. Uh, this is really critical. The duration can be quite critical because it can compensate for some of those how bright is it, the light intensities. Uh, not entirely, but it can help a little bit. Uh, typically our, our optimum is uh, 12 to 18 hours a day for lighting, about you know 12 on, 12 off. Uh, continuous lighting usually we would say would be bad. We want to try to put those on timers if we have supplemental lights uh, so that they uh, go on and off uh, as needed for those plants. The next slide then, the third factor of light would be the quality of light. And, and if you look at a rainbow, a rainbow has all spectrums of the light in it. Uh, sunlight comes in as white light and then is made up of all these different colors of the rainbow. Uh, lots of research has obviously been done on, on plants and what the different spectrums of light and the different colors of light uh, and what impact they have on plant growth. Uh, in general, just to kind of summarize those, uh, if we look at the blue light uh, part of the spectrum, that's usually for early growth, um, so when we're starting seeds uh, uh, and that sort of thing, when the new growth is coming out, that um, in general would be a, a good spectrum of light to have. Um, the orange-red um, end of the spectrum would be for later growth and flowering, uh, typically. But obviously, for best growth, we need really all parts of that uh, uh, light. And, uh, and different uh, light sources are going to usually give us a different color of light um, that we're uh, getting from that uh, light bulb or, or whatever that source is. Again, natural sunlight would be best. Um, because it has everything that the plants need. If we look at supplemental light then on our next slide, um, and we'll go on to the next slide, which shows um, some different light sources. I'll cover a, a couple of these today and uh, not spend a lot of time on this. Uh, but again, natural light would be best. Um, I, I don't spend really talk about windows too much, but um, think about, I, I just had some new windows put in, and, you know, some of our newer windows do uh, change the spectrum of light as it comes through that window, uh, if they're tinted or, or t you know, in some way. And so think about that. Um, we were thinking about putting in a, a greenhouse-type window, a garden window. I decided not to do that, but, um, you know, that a garden window, we were going to be really careful about what kind of, of window pane we put in there for the growth of the plants. Uh, it, supplemental lights then, the most common ways that we supplement light indoors would be through incandescent bulbs or fluorescent, and I'll cover each of those on the next two slides. Uh, there are grow lights, obviously, that you can buy uh, in um, theory. <laughs> in theory, the grow lights should have all spectrums of the colors in there. 
Uh, in reality, they probably don't have as much as what you would think, um, but I'll cover the incandescent and fluorescent kind of in, in general and show you, um, show you that. Um, there are sun lamps, obviously, or high-intensity discharge lamps and other types of uh, light sources out there. Uh, but today, just for purposes of this program, we're just going to cover um, incandescent and fluorescent. So the next slide, let's look at incandescent. Obviously, um, you're all pretty familiar with the standard light bulb. The standard old-fashioned light bulb is very hot, and so it does give out the red um, end of that light spectrum. Um, it uh, is easy to install. It's got easy uh, receptacles, obviously. You could just simply put out a, uh, one of your lamps, for example, and, and put a plant under it uh, to get it some extra incandescent light if you wanted to be as simple as that. Or put a spotlight. I have a little spotlight, uh, almost like a um, light you would clip on a, uh, on a desk or something. Um, relatively cheap incandescent lights. I did put a, a cross through the, the newer lights because those are really uh, not true incandescent lights. You could use those, obviously, and they do have a, a bit more of a fluorescent uh, spectrum to them. Um, but just wanted to make sure you know that uh, if it's the newer type of, of light bulb that you're seeing uh, there, uh, that those are not a true incandescent. They don't have all red red spectrum. They're they're cooler to the touch. The next slide showing then fluorescent lights and uh, fluorescent light bulbs obviously last a, a really long time. They are cool to the touch. Uh, they admit mostly blue light. Um, and really, it's, it's good to, I think this is actually Martha Smith's uh, idea that I got from her to, to label with a marker, a um, permanent marker, your bulbs when you get those to know when you uh, bought that light bulb and installed it so you uh, know to change it from time to time. Because they don't really, I mean, they kind of can burn out, but they usually don't, and, but they do um, diminish in, in use. So... Um, it's it's good to replace those every so often. Um, the other thing to kind of think about is the fluorescent lights, even though it emits mostly blue light, um, they actually emit, it, depending on the, the brand or the one that you buy, um, they could give other um, colors of light as well. And uh, Dr. Spomer, when I was uh, on campus, he came into my classroom and set out all these fluorescent bulbs from really cheap ones to really expensive ones and grow light ones. And, and he showed that actually there, um, some of those put out a pretty good full spectrum of light, um, even though they weren't necessarily grow light. So um, sometimes you can actually combine uh, simply a fluorescent light with an incandescent light to get that full spectrum. Um, if your, your fixtures are working that way or if um, price-wise that's what works best for you. Our next slide is uh, then we move into temperature and uh, your handout on the second page when it goes through the, the charts, there are a couple of those that, um, you know, for example, cucumbers require really hot weather to, to get good uh, fruiting on those. Um, you know, obviously we maintain our, our indoor temperatures in our homes for human comfort. Um, depending on, you know, what you prefer. Um, most plants prefer um, similar daytime temperatures, and they do like a little bit of a cooler a night temperature. But uh, check those different um, plants because some of those are just a little bit different. Uh, the next one then uh, looks at air quality, and uh, lots of research has been done on air quality about how, of course, plants can cleanse the air as well as, um, what uh, the plants need in the air in order to grow well. The main thing that we deal um, with typically in growing plants indoors would be relative humidity. Um, we have, as you probably know, if you have a humidifier running in your house, uh, our humidities are typically really, really low in, in our indoor homes. And so um, it, it, we really usually have to add some uh, to get best plant growth um, the, to add you know, extra humidity into the air. If you think about tropical settings uh, and uh, where maybe some of these plants could be native to originally, they may be very, very humid environments, warm and humid, 
And so we want to try to mimic some of that, but yet still uh, maintaining our human comfort. There are some uh, pollutants that could harm plants. Uh, the uh, ethylene, uh, some, some fruits give off ethylene, for example. Cleansers, if they get too close to too dusty of leaves, of course. And the one I didn't put in there, um, which I don't think I cover uh, in water either, would be um, fluoride. Uh, our, our town waters do have often have fluoride added to them, and, and some plants are pretty sensitive to fluoride addition. So just something to consider. The next slide then, just uh, thinking about our media, making sure we have a good general purpose potting soil typically, uh, something that, um, you know, is, um, is you know, sterile, obviously. Um, it may have some water absorbing polymers, although for some of these plants you might want to have better control than that. Um, those polymers um, would add uh, some moisture retaining ability to that soil. Uh, I typically prefer not to use those uh, just so I have more control of, of how much I water. Uh, some of those may have added fertilizers, and again, that's up to you. Uh, uh, a lot of these plants, that's not going to be a major issue. Um, it, if, if anything, it may help, but some people um, don't like to have that added fertilizer. So again, using the mix that uh, you find is works best for you. I typically just use kind of a general good uh, general uh, potting uh, mix. Slide then, uh, looking uh, just at uh, talking a bit about water here. Um, I said that the most limiting factor in growing plants indoors is light. Um, but most plants are actually killed um, by improper water, either uh, too little or too much. Uh, usually it's too much is my experience of when I've uh, I talked to homeowners. Uh, they um, just want to really, um, maybe their plants may be just a bit too much. So uh, trying to make sure that we water those plants thoroughly, filling up the entire soil profile as best we can so that the roots will fill up that container and really help it to grow a healthy uh, top growth. Um, and then let it dry out in between waterings. And, uh, you know, just kind of watering every Sunday doesn't necessarily work. We have to uh, actually stick our finger in the soil and, and uh, see if it does need uh, watering or not uh, is the best way. Um, and so sometimes, you know, some of those plants are going to uh, need a little bit different watering schedule than others. Uh, can't really just do them all on the same schedule indoors. The next slide, uh, just a little bit about pollination. Uh, some of these plants that I'm going to cover, really, this, uh, the ones I tried to include are not ones that this is a major issue uh, for, for some of those, most of them. Um, but uh, you, some crops, you do have to consider this. Uh, and of course, pollinating is the transfer of pollen in the flower. Um, some uh, crops do need the flower to be pollinated in order to develop the fruit or, or the vegetable. And so you might want to check um, online or, or check some sources to see um, what kind of pollination it needs. In, uh, in general, uh, if we just think about pollination, there's four general types of pollination in, in our plant world or plant kingdom. Uh, of course, some plants are pollinated by animals or wind. Uh, usually, um, uh, wind would be uh, one where maybe we indoors we could just go shake the plant a little bit and, and with the human assistance as you can see there um, we could shake the plant and maybe mimic wind. Um, Self-pollinating uh, plants uh, it's, is really preferred for indoors since we don't have wind or animals moving that pollen around typically. Uh, we can as humans um, actually assist and, and, and actually do manually do that pollination if needed. Uh, but many of our crops that you might want to consider, and I always say start simple and easy, <laughs> uh, would be uh, ones that don't need any pollinator at all. And uh, there's some of those that are listed here um, would be a, a good way to start, especially uh, growing plants indoors, uh, food indoors. Uh, our next uh, slide then shows a, a couple of ones that maybe we could help to pollinate a bit more. Uh, the ones that we could shake to mimic wind, uh, squash, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, and then some that we might need to actually hand pollinate uh, to mimic an insect landing and, and moving that pollen from um, the anther to the stigma would be things like uh, cucumbers, melons, berries, or tree fruits. 
Um, we obviously probably aren't going to be growing big old apple trees in our house, but there are some more varieties and, and certainly some citrus fruits that um, work pretty well indoors. So, again, just wanted to make sure that you think about pollination. If, if you're not getting, you're getting flowers but no fruit, uh, maybe see if uh, pollination might be an issue. The next slide, uh, then we're going to look at some different types of uh, indoor gardens and just kind of go through some examples for you in this next section. And then the last uh, part of the program, we'll look at some examples to try indoors. Um, we'll look at each of these a little bit here, um, some examples that I've either experienced or, or seen. Uh, window gardens, of course, are, are probably the simplest and where I would suggest a lot of people start if you have the right kind of window. Um, container gardens, um, there are some uh, certain types of, st of uh, that you can buy, kind of indoor gardens that you can buy um, that are already set up that you could use, and uh, just being really creative. There's lots of different ways to um, grow plants indoors. Looking first at window gardens and uh, looking, um, see if I can walk you through <laughs> this picture here. Uh, especially at Chris, Christmas time, there's a lot of herb kits on the market, and, and you can buy those kits that already have the seed in them, and they're pretty easy to um, just add, you know, seed it and add water and light and go. Uh, again, making sure that we use it, have enough light for them to grow adequately. Um, the one on the left is a, a house that was built um, that I was in. It's actually a converted farmhouse or actually a converted barn, um, but they put their windows in. Uh, she built her windows so that they were very, very wide sills, and then um, she actually does have a, a inflorescent bulb that she can hang and, and move up and down with a, a chain um, in that window uh, to, to do some starting. Um, some of her other windows have that, and she has uh, different ways to hang uh, herbs or containers or, you know, just to put uh, different uh, plants in her windows. Uh, the one in the bottom right is my kitchen window. My kitchen window faces south. Uh, in the winter, it uh, works really well for me. I, I did kind of had my husband built me a little platform there so I could uh, grow some, uh, put some bigger containers on there. And then in the summer, it actually is, there's a pergola out there and, with a tree, and so it actually does uh, shade it a little bit more in the summer, which is ideal for my situation, so I'm not burning up those plants on that windowsill. Um, I grow herbs there, or maybe some cuttings of other plants, but a, a, a lot of times I'll grow herbs on my a windowsill. I've also I kind of started some celery there one time, uh, grew some tops of onions. Um, so it, it's just a, a really, a, I enjoy watching the plants grow there um, at my kitchen window. So think about how your window is faced, um, you know, probably and. Uh, a, a south window might be, depending on what's outside of your window and what your window panes are composed of, a south window might be too bright for some of you and, and some types of, of plants that you're growing, they might uh, burn a bit. Uh, in that case, you might be able to use an east or a west window. North windows are probably too, um, they probably don't have enough light uh, for most of, of the food crops anyway. Um, and uh, you know, so just kind of consider your uh, exposures. The next slide, um, there are some creative things to do. Um, you could actually not just build a, a platform, but actually build a box into the window, um, which, and then, you know, if you're right there at the sink and you have a, um, a sprayer hose, you could actually water right there um, from your uh, sink and make it really, really simple. So that's uh, just kind of a creative thing to look at. Um, just a picture there on the right. Um, I, uh, a lot of people like this. I, I like using the little plastic bags with the zippers at the top that you get curtains and um, linens and bedspreads and sheets in. And I found that those make a really nice little mini greenhouse and they fit right on my window ledge. And, and so just a, a, you know, another way to kind of create a little uh, greenhouse environment on the window in the window garden. Uh, the next slide, uh, lots of different ways to grow herbs in containers. The one on the left is indoors, and obviously the one on the, uh, on the right is outdoors. 
Um, it is a strawberry pot with lots of little openings and holes, and so to take it indoors might be a bit of a watering challenge unless you set it down in a, a big tub or something. Um, but it certainly is a, a way to grow lots of plants in, in one container. Uh, the one on the left is a, a pretty large container. You can't really tell from the picture, but it too has, uh, I think it's mostly herbs, although there might, yeah, I think it's mostly herbs if I remember right, and then it has a trellis to uh, grow some of that up the back. And then again, as we just keep harvesting and cutting um, as we need those, um, they should continue to develop and, and have a nice um, a crop of herbs for, usually I would say that uh, herbs in a container like that would last us, you know, three or four months. It, it kind of depends on how much we're are using them and letting that uh, plant rejuvenate. The next slide is lots of different types of containers. Um, you know, obviously clay pots, uh, plastic pots, uh, buckets, you see lots of different uh, ways. So I, I can't cover them all, but uh, you're pretty familiar with lots of different types of containers that are available there, you know, for growing uh, plants. Uh, the one on the left you can see has uh, various herbs in those, and then the one on the right is a tomato. The other thing you might want to think about on the next slide shows self-watering containers. Um, the um, this edible landscaping made easy is, is the picture that I'm showing there. Um, but there are lots of different other ones um, that you can see. If you go to trade shows, you'll often see uh, some of these self-watering containers available. Uh, I have actually a self-watering container in my office I'm looking at right now. Um, it um, doesn't have a food plant in it, although I certainly could put a food plant in it. Um, it does, mine does keep it fairly, uh, really wet, and so um, actually I have an anthurium in it because it prefers a moisture environment. Um, but it, it could be, you know, if I uh, didn't leave it filled with water all the time that it uh, could grow other, other plants. Um, so, you know, you might want to try, especially if you're having trouble with those uh, smaller containers drying out too fast on you, that you could try uh, finding a self-watering container where there's a water reservoir in there and the plant then takes it up as it needs it, or building one yourself um, and, and finding a, a pattern for that. I mentioned on the next slide, I mentioned there are some other uh, things available. Uh, Jennifer Nelson and Jennifer Fishburn uh, do some really great programs on growing food and, and uh, they've talked uh, uh, this is where I learned it was from them, was how to build these salad tables and salad boxes. Um, they could be with soil, they could be hydroponic. Uh, there's different ways to do that and to be creative, uh, to um, have a way to grow just some salad greens in, in, your, in your house. Uh, obviously, the top one is outdoors, but it could easily be indoors as well. A commercial product called earthbox.com that I, um, I believe uh, some of our master gardeners have used across uh, the state in some projects. Um, and so we're uh, on this slide, uh, earthbox.com. Um, this uh, plant actually, the system, I guess I would say, um, is somewhat self-containing in that it has um, a little bit of spot um, you know, for soil. It has a place uh, for the uh, water at the bottom, and uh, it has a way to uh, attach a trellis or some kind of a, a structure for support. Um, what you're seeing here, obviously, are little cherry tomatoes on the right, and then strawberries in the middle. And uh, so there's um, kind of on wheels, so you can move it around uh, indoors or um, if you're using them outdoors, I guess you could move them around outdoors too, but uh, the earth boxes are, are available. And some people have uh, really liked using that system. You could make a similar system without doing the commercial product um, as well. Uh, the next slide then, um, if you have the ability to do an indoor greenhouse, obviously that would be ideal. Um, uh, and the one on the top there shows that greenhouse window, which I said I had uh, considered when I was we're redoing windows in our house, but decided not to go with that extra expense. Um, but uh, that would certainly could be an option. Uh, lots of ways to uh, create your own little mini greenhouse, and, and uh, if you don't want to actually put in a whole garden room. Uh, but, um, you know, as the more that you can add, uh, bring that light in, and take care of that uh, really limiting factor, uh, the better you are. 
The next slide, I uh, just wanted to throw a, a couple of examples in here that I thought were kind of uh, interesting. Um, the one on the left is called the nano garden concept. You can look that up online, and, and it's really, again, going back and looking at the kitchen of the future. I, I think this would be so neat <laughs> um, that you actually, in, in addition to having a refrigerator, you have a, a structure that actually grows plants, and it has its own lighting. It has um, its trays that move in and out. It could be hydroponic. It could be soil um, and uh, probably has some uh, different um, alarms and, and whistles to tell you when to do certain things to that uh, system. Uh, the one on the right, if you've been to the Rotunda building at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, they have, um, or they did have, a, a lot of um, plants growing there, many herbs in these uh, hydroponic type of uh, uh, systems, um, kind of in a vertical uh, a way. Next slide then, um, kind of taking that to even another level, if you look, you'll find something called a parasite farm. A parasite farm uh, uses a little bit of uh, several different uh, concepts together in the kitchen. And so it goes from the cutting board um, and then uh, drops the, the, the compost material right into a composter and uh, then there's a way to compost that into a soil product and then that soil product is moved over into a growing uh, area as you can see on the on kind of the bookcase at the back and then they have lights um, on that system as well so the idea is that it all is a self-contained system um, that all kind of works together um, in in the kitchen um, they're using a vermicomposting in in that system that's why it's called, again called the parasite farm the system that I use, which I think a lot of people have, is the Aero Garden, and uh, I have two of them, one at home, and actually I have one in my office. Uh, the one that you're seeing pictured at the top, uh, the black one is the one I have at home. Um, it's the pretty basic seven-pod Aero Garden. It's a hydroponic system. It has its own lights, uh, a fluorescent type of a grow light and um, it will tell you when you need to change those bulbs um, or they'll burn out and you have to, have to replace them. Um, you can use their pods um, with the seeds already in them or you can um, use your own seed and, and buy the, uh, a, an empty pod and, and grow your own seed. Um, I usually grow uh, kind of a, a tea herb type of mix or I have tried some salad greens, but I really do prefer herbs. And so what you're seeing here, there's some lemon balm, um, there's some lavender, uh, some basils. Um, I, I really like to grow a lot of cilantro. So right now my arrow garden at home is, uh, I just potted it up uh, last weekend and it's just starting to sprout. And so I'm getting all excited about, I'm having my fresh herbs there in, in the kitchen. It does tell you when to feed it and, um, you know, when to water it. And, and so it's a pretty self-contained system. The light goes up and down. Um, the one on the bottom left is one, a little ladybug. It's a three pod. Uh, I actually have in my in my office I'm growing petunias for um, nice winter flower color um, but I could also grow uh, some type of food crop in there as well and they also do sell um, you know some other types of, of food crops um, too um, if you look in their catalog the next one is a, a, a vertical garden. The tower garden is one that I think I actually saw it the first time at a Master Gardener State Conference when it was in Moline a couple of years ago. Um, there are other types of those, several different ones on the market. Um, again, those are an aeroponic system that uh, they're growing the plants in water. Um, so you have to have the right nutrient solution to grow those plants and really some aeration of that water in there that moves that up and down that tower. Um, and then the wall garden on the left, which I would love to have, that has kind of its own trickle irrigation, if it's soil or it may be hydroponic as well, but um, lots of different, um, you know, kind of these creative types of gardens are, are coming along on the market. Or in the next uh, picture, you could be really creative, and if you're a Pinterest user, you can find all kinds of different things on Pinterest that are interesting. Um, and so I just threw a couple of uh, slides in here with some Pinterest ideas that I, I found um, on there. There's a few on this picture, and then the next slide shows um, some more. 
Um, that's where I got the idea to grow carrots in bottles, and I did do that. Uh, it, it, I didn't have enough light, I'll be honest, um, but it did work. I did get some little carrots, and it's kind of neat to see those through that clear um, container as they're as they're growing. Microgreens, again, just kind of um, these are those takeout containers that you could grow um, the microgreens in and, and harvest them when they're really small uh, for salads and, and other cooking. Um, the next slide then would be um, kind of moving on to different types of plants to try. Um, whimsical is what I'm calling this, although many, many of you, I'm sure, if not most of you on this program today, have uh, used kitchen scraps uh, to grow different plants. Um, there are lots of foods that will regrow from ki kitchen scraps. Uh, the ones that we commonly you know, talk about, especially with kid projects, would be pineapples or avocados. Um, but, you know, there are others that you can do as well. I, I've done the cel celery. That's actually my celery all the way on the right. Uh, just put it in a little bit of water, um, or you could put it in soil. And then the greens grow, and I just use the, you know, the, the green leaves um, in my cooking. You can grow more green onion tops. Uh, actually, I've, I've done that. Um, or you can grow garlic uh, bulbs, and you can grow... Um, ginger and, and other uh, plants as, as well from some of those scraps that you have in the kitchen. So um, looking at those, uh, you know, have some fun with that if you want to. Let's then, on our next slide, then look at just ending up the um, program here with what are some examples that you might want to try. And I'm going to start with the simplest, which are the herbs. And if um, if you haven't tried growing herbs indoors, try it. Um, and you may, again, the next slide showing five to try. Uh, basil, uh, cilantro, which is also coriander, it, um, and I'll cover each of those on, a, on their own slide. Lavender, uh, the mints are good for growing indoors, and then thyme. Uh, depending on what you like to cook, you know, I, I like to use a lot of basil. I like pesto. I like adding basil to uh, sauces and such, and so I, I do use that. The cilantro I like um, using when in Mexican cooking and um, in other types of vegetable dishes, so I like to grow it and, uh, and have that fresh cilantro. Mints um, for my teas and lavender, actually, both of those I use in teas a lot. I do a lot of uh, fresh tea, and so those are the herbs that I've found that are, are kind of my uh, standard ones that I like to grow indoors. Uh, looking at those individually, then, the next slide shows basil, and you can see my basil on the bottom right there, a globe basil that um, is growing in my air garden. Um, obviously, basil, many of you, I'm sure, have grown that outdoors. Uh, it's an annual available in lots of different types and colors and, and really flavors and smells, odors to them. You can have lemon basil. Uh, the, I really like the lemon basil for tea. Um, there's some Thai basils that are more spicy. The just straight basil is the one I like uh, just for uh, standard pestos. Uh, the opal and the purple basils I like for making vinegars. And so lots of different ones available. Um, typically when you're growing most of these herbs, you're not growing them for the flowers. And so um, if you get to the point where they would flower indoors, which not all of them will get enough light to be able to do that, um, typically we would remove those flowers. Um, in my case, I hopefully am using them enough and cutting it back and letting it regrow and cutting it back and letting it regrow that um, it's never going to get to the really the flowering stage, that I'm, I'm using the leaves as, as much as I can. And again, uh, um, my herb gardens indoors will usually last, you know, three months or so. The next slide looks at cilantro, which is also known as coriander. Uh, cilantro is the green leaf part, and coriander would be the seed. And so we're probably not growing it indoors for the coriander stage. Uh, actually, I grow it exclusively, if at all possible, for the leaves and just keep trying to cut it back as much as I can. I have had it bloom indoors when I haven't kept up with getting it cut back uh, um, in a timely manner. Again, this is an annual. It, it grows really readily from seed, um, very finely cut leaves, um, that, um, and it does have those flowers if you let them go. Um, but again, in, indoors, usually we're cutting them back, and they're not going to reach their full height. 
um, although in the right setting it, it can get up to about a foot tall um, if you're not cutting them back. The next herb would be mint, and I prefer to grow mint indoors, and I don't really like to grow it outdoors because it can be so invasive if it's uh, if you're not really careful. I have some mint in my yard, and maybe some of you have seen pictures of that. Um, at other programs, it was a previous owner had planted mint, and so I really am just going to have mint um, forever, probably in that part of the garden, or at least I let it stay there. I'm really careful. Um, with how I move plants in and out of that particular area so I'm not moving the mint around. But I do use it um, outdoors. But I, again, prefer to grow mint indoors. Um, it is a perennial, uh, very aromatic, lots of different types of mints available as well. Uh, but again, I, I like to, you know, just take off a piece of mint and put in my tea or my water or you know, make a hot tea where I uh, take a, a fair amount of it and then pour hot water over it and then strain it out. So um, lots of different types of mints that you can grow either in hydroponics like this one or uh, in soil. The next herb, then the last one I was going to cover is thyme. And again, it's a perennial, lots of different types of thyme available. Um, you've probably noticed I do a lot of tea herbs and so and growing lots of tea, and so I, I like the lemon thyme uh, for teas. Um, there are some other thymes that, uh, you know, work for other types of uses, depending on what you like to cook for your family. Um, but uh, usually other pretty small aromatic leaves, probably for indoors, some of those smaller types are a little bit better to do. Uh, again, most of the time we're not growing, even though it says perennial, we're not growing them as, you know, perennials. That's going to last for a really long time, although you could grow them as a house plant for an extended period of time. But typically, um, at least in my experience, the way I, I manage my herb gardens indoors is that um, they're short term and then I replant them to get really good, you know, growth again later. Um, so they're, they're not really a perennial uh, type of uh, growth that I'm, I'm trying to get out of them. The next slide then, looking at five vegetables to try indoors. Uh, the absolute easiest would be greens of uh, spinach or kale or, you know, various types of greens. So let's look at those. Uh, the next slide, um, you can grow greens of, of lots and lots of different ways. You can grow them in little pots on the uh, windowsill. You can grow them in, this is a, aero, uh, a hydroponic system actually. I think this one's um, at one of the, our community colleges. Um, you could grow them, you know, in those salad tables. Or as you can see here on the slide, you could grow them in a bucket. Um, about four to six inches apart in a half gallon bucket is um, what's recommended. Uh, there are some dwarf varieties available. I tried to throw in some dwarf varieties to look for um, if you would like to try those that might, you know, work really better indoors, especially if you're going for cabbage. Um, but um, really some of those other kinds of greens, any, any of those will work. So um, give, a, get a, give that a try if you haven't already. The tomatoes um, that you can grow indoors, this one is called... Um, well, there are several smaller types, uh, kind of the small patio type containers would be the ones that I would recommend indoors. Uh, as you can see in the on the slide, of a regular tomato, you'd usually do like one plant in a five-gallon bucket. Cherry tomatoes, the smaller tomatoes, maybe one plant in a one-gallon bucket. But there are some very small uh, tomato types out there. Uh, for example, uh, Tiny Tim, uh, I've just listed four. Uh, micro Tom um, is one, actually, when I was in graduate school, I did some research on growing Micro Tom tomatoes hydroponically in a, uh, a growth chamber. We were looking at different, um, you know, different inputs in the hydroponic system, um, but they grew really well. We had some pretty tasty tomatoes growing indoors uh, under lights in a hydroponic system. Uh, those tomatoes don't get very big, uh, those little smaller types, and they can fruit um, even at those smaller um, sizes. So those probably would be what I would recommend. Um, the peppers, uh, again, pollination on tomatoes and peppers, you might have to be a little bit careful with and, and try to help them along. Uh, the recommendations, as you see on your handout, would be one plant in a two-gallon. Um, and then lots of different types, obviously, of peppers available, um, hot bell, and then ornamental. I like growing ornamental peppers. Um, usually don't eat them, although we could. 
Um, but um, you, maybe, you know, you have your favorite pepper that you might want to try. Again, the, the peppers, um, if I look at the, the handout here, uh, bell peppers, it's going to say, requires really hot air temperatures. And uh, so that's, that's a limiting factor indoors unless you're really able to add a, a good heat source. And, and what you may find is that you have trouble with those plants getting to flower and setting seed or setting fruit. Um, possibly because of the temperatures as much as light. Um, even some, I've had people tell me I have great light for my peppers. They should be doing something, um, but I really think it was a temperature problem that they were experiencing. Uh, the next one then, uh, I just wanted to caution. As we're growing plants indoors, there are some ornamental plants that are grown indoors that look a lot like a pepper. Um, but some of those um, are not edible, and so please be careful and make sure that we're growing edible peppers. Uh, at Christmas time, we'll see these Christmas cherries and Jerusalem cherries, the Christmas peppers, this plant uh, available, uh, even though it looks like a, a little uh, pepper or maybe even a, a, you know, a salad tomato. It's actually a very poisonous plant, so be careful and make sure we're growing edible plants if we're going to eat them. The next uh, vegetable to try would be a radish. Um, I think radishes, you could actually eat tops or uh, let them grow into the radish uh, bulb underground. Uh, you can grow quite a few in a small space, and there's lots of different types of radishes available as well. So uh, you could try that. Radishes also work really well as a microgreen, where you're just letting a little bit of the greens grow and then and using that in a, in a salad. And then would be, um, uh, I think it's the last vegetable that I mentioned, and I've already talked about growing carrots indoors. Uh, carrots are really fun, I think, for kids, too, just to, as a way to show them how a plant grows and, you know, where our food comes from and, and how that carrot is growing underground. Uh, two to three inches apart in a one-quart container. I actually took just a two-liter uh, um, bottle, you know, plastic bottle, uh, like a Coke bottle, and... Um, cut the top off, actually use the top as kind of a, a cover until it germinated almost to create, you know, a little bit of moisture, better germinating environment in there. Um, some of the smaller varieties that are available, um, you know, in the as seed sources I've got listed here that might work better indoors. Um, but again, I, I think light and temperature could be a real factor with growing carrots. I didn't have any trouble getting them to grow. Um, but uh, they didn't really seem to mature the way that I wanted them to. So, um, you know, have to. I really probably needed to move them to a warmer spot or maybe give them some bottom heat or something to uh, help them along. The last one then, um, the five fruits maybe to try, and um, I, have, I, I have not tried these, although I do grow um, – most of some of these outdoors, um, and some of you maybe have grown them indoors. Uh, strawberries, lots of information out there right now about growing strawberries. The the two top pictures were both taken in a hoop house in southern Illinois at a at a University of Illinois farm, and uh, um, and they were beautiful. <laughs> uh, growing in um, the the strawberries were growing hydroponically, and the raspberries were growing in soil in a ground bed. Um, this banana actually is kind of more for fun. That's my banana. I always have a couple of them flower outside. They don't have enough of a season to develop. If I had a really good high light inside, which I don't, um, or was able to add really high intensity light, um, which I have not done, I probably could get those to develop a little bit more if I brought them indoors. But um, I have not tried to grow my bananas indoors. I enjoy them outdoors in the summer. And then the figs, uh, there are um, some binding figs and some other types of figs that um, you could try as well. Citrus, there are several, going in the next slide, several different types of citrus. Um, the picture here is the Ponderosa lemon. This is growing in the conservatory at Luthi Botanical Garden in Peoria. Uh, it's actually a, my hand there, so you can see it's a pretty, pretty large fruit. But again, that's a conservatory with really good light. Um, but some others that if you look at the, you know, literature and, and you look and see uh, from reputable extension sites that would be recommended for growing indoors would be, uh, these are some of those, the Meyer lemon, 
uh, a kumquat um, and some of the uh, other oranges and limes. So some other plants uh, to try. Um, I was at a business in Peoria uh, last Friday and I saw a, a little orange tree with fruit on it in a in really not a great setting, but it was growing pretty well. So um, certainly if you haven't, I'm sure many of you have tried some of these plants, um, give those a try. The last one then would be um, the picture here would be to harvest and eat and um, I will go ahead and answer a, a couple of these questions. The question from McDonough County was um, do you dry herbs to use for teas or fresh or either and I actually um, do both. Um, most of my herbs that I grow indoors I, I um, I'd probably use fresh. I prefer to use fresh. And if you're using for tea, if you're using an herb fresh, you need three times more than you need dried. Um, the picture on the left is my um, herbs drying. I like to dry them um, in my kitchen. Um, I like to use the metal baskets and then just line them with a little bit of uh, paper towel and uh, and then, you know, just loosely put them in there and let them sit for a couple of weeks and, and let them dry and then I put them in a in a, a, a solid or you know a, a container that I can close in a um, really well and put into um, a dark kind of place. I don't like to keep my herbs dried for more than about two years or they really start to lose their essence um, but there's lots of different ways to um, harvest and eat those uh, plants. Um, just finishing up the slides here. Mostly have fun. Have fun with those as you're as you're going along. So let me move back over here to the um, questions and see if I can answer some of them. Um, first one, Anne. Sorry, it took so long to get back to you. Um, are a set of three T5 lights with 3,500 lumens good? Um, and you know, Anne, I'm not sure about that because uh, I, I don't know if I really, um, I just don't know if I can answer that, but I can certainly look it up and see if I can figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just not sure about that. But I answered the McDonough one. Valerie, does a mini greenhouse such as a pot bottle or plastic bag help intensify light or is it just to maintain moisture? Yeah, it really doesn't help with the light much. If anything, um, some of those plastics probably reduce the light coming through. Um, so it's really more to maintain moisture and temperature um, in, in those settings. The reason why I like the little bags um, or uh, something that doesn't seal completely tight like a Ziploc is sometimes I can get too much moisture and heat in there and um, the zippers are, are um, tend to let more um, air in, you know, kind of airflow. Do tomatoes need light 24-7 to germinate and for seedlings? No, again, all, all plants are going to need some dark. And so um, you can look at, you know, the labels and see what's recommended for the particular tomato you're growing. Um, but in general, we don't need, um, you know, solid light all of the time. If, if you look at the self-contained systems that you can buy and, you know, use their little kits, for example, um, there, if it has a light in, in on it, it will go on and off. You set it for vegetable or herb or um, flowers or whatever, but it will, the light will go cycle on and off. It doesn't stay on all the time. Ginger, um, mine tends to go dormant in the winter. The stems fall off. Um, yeah, Diana, I've not grown ginger, so I'm I'm not sure, you know, exactly how to do that. Um, but we can certainly try to find the answer for you. Or if anybody else online wants to um, put the answer into the chat window, please feel free to do that. My guess is, though, because ginger is a really tropical plant, that uh, it um, is a temperature and light issue, maybe a temperature um, issue. And so um, maybe trying to find a way to keep it a little bit warmer and then, um, you know, the light might be a, a factor as well. Carrot tops, um, yeah, you can eat carrot tops. They're pretty carroty, <laughs> um, Sharon. Uh, let's see, to pollinate lemon, do you have to touch the flowers together? Is shaking the tree enough? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the lemon and see which one it is, if it's a self-pollinated lemon or not. Um, 
and you know exactly um, that particular plant what what you need to do for it. Um, my, you know, typically, you know, it probably could shake it, um, but um, like, again, I, I'd have to know exactly the situation. LED lights, um, probably not. Uh, they're probably not bright enough. I have some LED lights like under my counter, for example, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the spectrum is there, but they're not as bright as I would like them to be. So I um, again, you'd have to look and see what the intensity is that that particular setup that you have is is putting out. Uh, plants that require a pollinator, can you use a house fan on them? Again, that would be if it's a wind pollinated situation, um, or if the flower is configured enough that um, you know that it will move the pollen around properly to 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 pollinate it. Um, a fan, I, I'm not, sh again, I, I've not experienced that, so I'm not sure. It does sound like, in theory, it could work, but, um, you know, what I've read, some of those, you do have to shake them a little bit harder than what maybe a fan would um, provide. Uh, let's see. Let me go I'm on down here. Good. You give more information on growing celery. How tall does the regrowth get? Um, I, in growing celery, again, it needs it to be fairly warm with a lot of light. And um, uh, mine has grown about six to twelve inches, something like that. I've not really gotten the stalks to to develop much, uh, but uh, you know, give it a try and see what what happens for you. Uh, let's see again here. Uh, bananas. Can you explain a bit about growing bananas in our climate? Um, yeah, I grow bananas outside in the summer um, around my pool, kind of to give that tropical feel. Um, they grew, I put a, I plant them right in the ground. Um, right now, they're overwintering in my basement. I dig them up in the fall. Uh, probably about October or into November, depending on the year. I cut off all the leaves, leaving a stalk of about three foot, and dig them up and getting them as many roots as I can, and throw them in a five-gallon bucket, and put them in my basement and forget about them. Um, don't really water them all winter. Let them go dormant. And then in a, as soon as it starts warming up, which I hopefully will be in a couple weeks, I'll bring them upstairs and put them in my sunroom or my room with the south exposure and let them um, really water a, water them a lot to try to push some growth so that I can um, put them outside. They will be growing a little bit more. But um, the bananas uh, grow really well here uh, in the heat of our summer. Um, but obviously there are some dormant bananas, but I like the just straight banana. They sucker a lot, so um, you can have lots to save and, and, and uh, share with others. Uh, let's see. Are grow bulbs really worth the extra cost? Um, you know, I, I can't answer that uh, entirely, but um, from what I've been told by researchers, you can get the same effect with cheaper bulbs, and so you don't necessarily have to um, use the grow bulb. Um, having said that, I have found that the bulbs that are provided for at least the arrow garden. Um, they are a very specific spectrum, and they do work really well. And when they start to go bad, the plants don't grow as well. So, um, again, you know, it's really up to you. But um, I've actually had pretty good success in general, um, you know, starting seed and growing some other plants um, with uh, just the cheap types of fluorescent bulbs, as long as they're fresh and new and, and really a good intensity. Um, using hot and cold fluorescent on the same growth stand be sufficient. Um, yeah, actually, I, I do like combining the two. Um, fluorescent do come, as you say, in, in different spectrums, both a, a, what they call a hot and they call a cold. So it's going to have blue and red um, light. So those um, can help to give, you know, if you have two bulbs in your receptacle, you could um, put one of each, and, and that would help to give a better spectrum of light. 
Um, and the master gardener in Champagne wanted to share that ginger grows in the tropics in the shade. That's the difficulty in, in growing here. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing that. Well, let's see. Oh, lots of questions coming through here. Um, what did you grow the basil in? Looks like a glass. Um, again, I grow basil in lots of different things. So basil is pretty easy to grow, so um, I don't. I usually grow it in soil um, unless I'm using my arrow garden and then it's growing in water. Um, again, it, it, it just a simple little, you know, even just a little small clay pot with some soil on the windowsill um, it works pretty well for basil for me. Okay, let's see. Judith is sharing about teas. I love that. To make a cool herbal tea, twist or squeeze a bunch of herbals and let sit an hour or so in a pitcher and a counter and pour into glasses with or without ice. Um, and then the hydroponic garden at O'Hare. I've not been to O'Hare in quite some time, so if anybody can tell us if it's still there and, and kind of their experience, that would be great. Um, how close can you put the grow light to the plant? Excellent question. Um, I didn't really cover the distance of the light away from the plant, and it needs to be as close as possible without touching. And so um, I would say within six inches or less, if you can, get them as close as you can. So if you've got kind of a homemade system like my dad has, he's got it on chains so he can move his lights up and down, or he uses the clip-on um, incandescence to really try to, um, you know, get more control of, of where that light is. If you have the light too far away, um, those plants will become pretty spindly and in, in reaching for the light. Uh, the formula mixture for hydroponics, yeah, there's lots of information out there. Um, do a search for, you know, a really uh, uh, extension site somewhere to get reputable uh, information or use a, a commercial mix. There's lots of different ones available on the market. In the arrow garden, is the water moving, flowing, or standing still? It, um, the different arrow gardens, depending on how much you pay, um, have different levels of, of aeration. Mine is uh, just a little uh, aerator stone and doesn't really have a pump, and so it's pretty um, slow, but it does have some movement, which is important. So. Um, there are other air gardens that have a, a pump and actually pump the water a, a bit more and move it and better, uh, flowing it through the system. Insects, uh, yeah, I didn't really cover insects, uh, spider mites on mints and other herbs. Um, you know, insects uh, on food, and they're really isn't a whole lot you can do other than, uh, I'm going to just be honest, throw those away and start over. Um, I don't, you know, there's really not anything we could use to um, control those indoors um, in a way that could be safe to eat. So I'm, I'm, you know, really, even my house plants, I, I don't really tolerate the insects. I'll, you know, um, try to just dispose of those and start over if I can. Um, spider mites, though, typically are an indicator of dryness, and so, you know, maybe that is an issue as well. All right. I think we went through most of those questions except Anne. I've not helped you. <laughs> and um, I need to do a little bit of more uh, research on that so I can, because I'm not familiar with that nomenclature in that light. So, um, Anne, I'll, if you want to... Um, you know, look up my information and email me or, or something. I can I can try to get that information for you. Okay, I'm just going to take a few more questions uh, as we're running over time here. Um, uh, last couple here, or at least one other. I have a 10-year-old orange plant that doesn't bloom. What could be going on with it? Um, I, again, you know, I... Without knowing exactly the situation, my, my guess would be light um, as the limiting factor indoors. Um, but, you know, I can't answer exactly, you know, what, what what's going on. I don't know. Have you tried different, you know, light exposures or maybe adding some supplemental light to it um, to see if that would help or 
or I, you know, depending on the variety or what one you have, maybe it is the age yet that it just isn't ready to bloom yet. So I, yeah, I'm not not sure exactly. Sorry. Okay, hopefully you're all inspired to grow at least a simple herb in your home if you haven't already. Um, but uh, um, I encourage you to try to grow some kind of a food indoors and, and have fun with it. And, uh, and, and again, as the slide shows, uh, have fun with your family growing food indoors. Thank you all.